In this video lecture, we're going to look at the next step in respiratory physiology, and that's gas exchange. Since we've got the air into our lungs, ventilation, now we got to think about how we're going to get the oxygen across into the blood and get the CO2 out. But we also want to think about gas exchange in terms of internal gas exchange, and that's also moving the oxygen from the blood into the tissues. And again, external gas exchange then would be between the alveoli and the blood. So to do this, we got to look at the gas laws. One of those gas laws is Dalton's law. Air has a mixture of gases in it, so that 760 millimeters of mercury reflects the pressure of all the gases together. What Dalton's law says that is that each gas contributes to the total pressure in proportion to its abundance. So we can think of each gas having a partial pressure. That is, the partial pressure is the pressure contributed by a single gas in a mixture of gases. So we can look at, in a sense, like Skittles. If my bag of Skittles has pink, yellow, green, and blue, they each contribute to the total amount of Skittles proportioned to how many there are. Okay, And I can think of that for gases as well. If I know the partial pressure of one gas, second, third, fourth, those added together would make my total pressure. So let's look and do those calculations to get an idea of what we're coming from. So the nitrogen gas is, makes up 78.6% of the atmosphere. And I don't care where you are on this planet, you're going to have 78.6% of that air is nitrogen, whether you're here at sea level or you're on top of Mount Everest, it's still 78.6%. So I'm going to take that 78.6% and multiply it times the 760 millimeters mercury for the atmospheric pressure at sea level, and I get a partial pressure of nitrogen at 597.36. And it's symbolized this way with a part P with a, um, the gas subscripted. Sometimes you don't see the subscript, but I try to do that. Um, oxygen makes up 20.9% of the atmosphere, so all I have to do is multiply that number by the 760 to get oxygen's partial pressure. And then I can do that also with the other gases. So if I if I look at there's a lot of other gases, which this is just some of them. And then of course we have carbon dioxide. We know carbon dioxide contributes 0.04%, so I can do that one. But I don't really care that much about these guys. They're not that going to play a role in respiration particularly, so I just grouped them together. And so the partial pressure of all those gases together is this. If I add those values up then, I get the total atmospheric pressure. Now keep in mind though that the atmospheric pressure is going to vary depending on the altitude. So these partial pressures are dependent not only on how the percent of the, of the atmosphere that's composed of that gas, but also where you are on this planet. Okay, and I will expect you to be able to do these calculations. I'll give you, though, the percents, and I'll give you where you are, what the total atmospheric pressure is, so you need to be able to calculate partial pressures. Another gas law is Henry's law. Now, Henry's law says that the amount of particular gas in solution is directly proportional to its partial pressure. So this basically says the higher the pressure, the more of that gas I can get into solution. So, for example, here I have a low pressure, so I don't have much of that gas in solution. But if I increase the pressure by dropping the piston, so now that the pressure is higher, I get more of that gas in solution. Now, that is the principle behind um, making pop. Pop is basically sugar water and carbon dioxide dissolved in, the, in that sugar water. But to get the carbon dioxide into solution, you have to put it under a great deal of pressure because it's not very soluble at all. Carbon dioxide is not soluble in water. Not very soluble anyway. So in the bottling company then, they'll take that water and they'll force the carbon dioxide into solution by making the pressure really high and then they quick put the lid on. So then when you open the lid, you hear the sound. That's the release of the pressure. And then you see the bubbles of carbon dioxide come out and there's um, the fizz that you get with pop. 
Now, one of the problems, though, associated with Henry's Law, back to scuba diving again, is going to be decompression sickness or the bends. When you're scuba diving, you're breathing in normal atmosphere or normal gas, mixture of gases. So you've got the nitrogen, the oxygen, carbon dioxide that's in the tank, and you're just breathing in normal air. Well, at the surface, the pressure you're under is at one atmosphere of pressure. But when you go down to 10 meters depth, now you're under two atmospheric pressure. That means you're breathing in at a higher pressure. So Henry's law says then, if I'm under a higher pressure, more gas is going to solution. And that includes nitrogen. Right now you get some nitrogen going to solution. It doesn't make any difference. It doesn't contribute to our physiology at all. So no big deal. It, and it's not contributing here either. It just means more is going under solution or into solution. Now, when I go back up to the surface, if I go up nice and slowly, then that nitrogen is going to come out of solution because I'm decreasing the pressure, which means less can be in solution. But my lungs get rid of that just fine. But if I'm down here swimming and I forget my scuba diving lessons that say go up slowly after a dive, and I see a shark and I panic and I go to the surface very fast, then all that nitrogen is going to come out of solution very fast and it's going to bubble. It's going to form bubbles in my joints, in my bloodstream, in the cerebral spinal fluid, and that's when I get the bends. And that's going to be the problem. I mean, one, it's painful. Two, it could kill me because I can get air embolisms, and then that would block blood flow and, and cause death. Um, so one of the things you're taught in scuba diving is you have to ascend slowly so that nitrogen can come out of solution very slowly. Think of it analogous to opening pop. If I have my pop under pressure, so I haven't opened it yet, sometimes when you, you know, when you drop the pop or it's been someone's obnoxious and, and mixes the pop up, um, it builds up that pressure. And if you open it too fast, all that, those bubbles come out of solution very fast and um, there's a mess. So this is kind of like opening up a pop bottle very fast. A lot of bubbles come out very fast and you get the bends. But if you open that same pop bottle very slowly, just open a little crack and then let it settle and then a little crack and let it settle, then that keeps the pop from overflowing out of the, out of the top of the bottle. And that's the equivalent to in scuba diving. If you've been down at depths for a long time, you just come up very slowly and even stop at stages and wait and let and then keep going up and then stop and wait a little bit. And that gives the nitrogen a chance to come out of solution very slowly and the lungs can get rid of it without any bubbles forming. Now in gas exchange, what we're gonna be doing is looking then and using these laws, this idea of partial pressures and where the gases are, um, and moving that or causing diffusion of those gases across our in this example here, respiratory membrane. I don't expect you to know the numbers anywhere, but you ought to know at least relatively speaking whose numbers would be higher than the other ones. But if you make, if you, you can make the numbers work for you. For example, if we're here in the alveoli and here's the blood coming in, I want to get rid of CO2. I want CO2 to go from the blood into the alveoli. So let's make sure the numbers work in that direction because remember everything's going to diffuse from greater pressure to lesser pressure. So the CO2 in the blood coming into the alveoli should be higher than the CO2 in the alveoli and you can see it is. So CO2 diffuses across into the alveoli and then you can exhale the CO2. At the same time I want oxygen to come into my capillaries so the blood coming in should have a lower partial pressure than the alveoli's partial pressure in order for that to happen. So oxygen is going to move from greater partial pressure to lesser partial pressure. And so it's going to move across into the capillaries. And so by the time the blood leaves the capillaries, you'll notice the CO2 has decreased and the oxygen has increased. And then it moves out circulation to the tissues. 
Here's basically the internal and external gas exchange. So here's the external respiration or gas exchange. So we have CO2 moves out, oxygen we want to have move in. So if you look down here at the CO2, the CO2 coming in to the lungs is at a 45 partial pressure. The CO2 in the alveoli is only 40. So it's going to move from the capillaries into the alveoli and then I can exhale it. The oxygen coming into the lungs has a partial pressure of 40. What's in the lungs itself is 105. So oxygen is going to move from the alveoli into the capillaries from the 105 to the 45. Now, and the internal respiration is just going to be moving things in the opposite direction. By the time the oxygen gets down here, it's at about 100 partial pressure. Notice that the oxygen partial pressure in the tissue is only 40, so it's going to move from greater pressure in the capillaries out to the tissues, the direction I want it to go. The CO2 is at 45 in the tissues. It comes into the capillaries at 40, so it's going to go from greater the tissues into the blood, into the capillaries, and then we can move the CO2 back to the lungs and exhale it. So again, it's going to move the direction I want it to go. Okay. Another couple things to notice on this is that the air you breathe in has an oxygen partial pressure of 159. By the time it gets in the alveoli, it's only at 105. This is because that air that we inhale mixes with the residual volume, or all the air in the anatomical dead space, which is going to be higher in CO2 and lower in oxygen, and that's going to drop its partial pressure. And then you can see, too, that even though the alveoli partial pressure is 105, the oxygen in the blood leaving those alveoli is at 100, and that drop is because, remember, we've got, we've got some bad alveoli, some alveoli that don't do very good gas exchange, so they're not going to get a lot of oxygen into the capillaries, and so when you mix all that together, it ends up dropping that partial pressure a little bit, okay? Again, don't have to know the numbers, but you should be able to think about the direction in which the um, gases should be moving so you can think about where are the partial pressures bigger. The efficiency of the diffusion across our um, membranes have a lot of particular structures that are going to help enhance gas exchange. Now the difference in partial pressures across the respiratory membrane is very great. So remember we saw in the alveoli the partial pressure of oxygen is 105. The capillaries coming in, the partial pressure of oxygen is only about 40. That's a big gradient. The bigger the gradient, the more diffusion that takes place. Yay, um, we get lots of oxygen into our capillaries, just what we want. Altitude sickness comes into play there, and I'll look, and look at that um, in the next slide, and I'll come back to the other ones. In altitude sickness, remember oxygen has is only 20.9% of the atmosphere, and that doesn't matter where you're at. So if I do the partial pressure of oxygen at sea level, I get 158.8. But if I go to Mount Everest, the partial pressure of oxygen is only 52.9. Now remember, the oxygen coming in to the alveoli in the blood is at 40. And if it's 52.9 that you're breathing in, it's probably only about 50 by the time it gets down to the alveoli, which means you've only got a gradient of about 10 millimeters of mercury. That's not much at all. The best you can hope for is a partial pressure of 50 leaving your alveoli in the capillaries, and that's like half of what it should be. And that's why you simply can't do that. You can't go to Mount Everest without a tank of oxygen. Now, some of the Nepalese can handle that because they've been they have adapted to it, um, but there's very few individuals who are capable of doing that. Anything greater than 8,000 feet, you can end up with altitude sickness. So, in order to handle altitude sickness, you have to acclimate at, to those lower oxygen levels. And that's the importance of training before you go try to hike up Mount Everest. Okay. Now, other um, important things about 
for effective diffusion would in include the distance involving gas exchange is small. Remember, it's only about 0.5, millim 0.5 microns is the thickness of that respiratory membrane. That's real thin. So anything fluid build up, builds up the, the size of that respiratory membrane, and so you're not going to get good gas exchange. Also, the gases are lipid soluble, so they can go right through the cell membrane and through the surfactant just fine. We don't have to worry about that. The total surface area is very large. Um, it's about 1,500 square feet. That's huge. But of course, any disease that decreases that surface area, like lung cancer, emphysema, is going to end up reducing our gas exchange. And then the last one is ventilation and perfusion are coordinated. That is, they they are coupled. So we'll look at that next. And this is the idea of ventilation, perfusion, coupling. Now ventilation is the amount of air you move um, through the or the amount of air that reaches the alveoli. Perfusion is blood flow, how much air, how much blood moves through those capillaries. And we want to match those. It's basically the idea. So let's say here you've got a kind of a crappy alveoli. Notice it's kind of flat. It's not nice being round like that. So we basically have a mismatch between ventilation and perfusion. Our ventilation stinks. The alveoli is not fully inflated, but the perfusion is really good. Well, if that's the case, then I don't have a whole lot of ventilation, so I'm not going to get much oxygen into the capillaries. So the partial pressure of the oxygen in the capillaries gets crappy. But the CO2 is going to build up because I, I'm, again, not getting very good ventilation. So in response to that, that will cause these blood vessels to constrict. By constricting them, I'm matching the ventilation perfusion. In other words, I'm not going to waste my blood going to this crappy alveoli if it's not going to give me very good gases. Um, and so I, I match the two. But let's say now we have a match, a mismatch the other way. Say it's really good alveoli, but the perfusion's kind of crappy. So the blood vessels not bringing enough blood in. Well now I'm going to have lots of oxygen getting into that blood but the CO and, the, and get rid of a lot of CO2. So the partial pressure of CO2 is going to be low, high oxygen because I got plenty of gas exchange going on so I get the values kind of really enhanced in the blood. So in response to that those pulmonary arterioles are going to dilate and now I get more blood going to great alveoli. So now my ventilation and perfusion match. Yay, it's beautiful. I get lots of gas exchange going on here and take all the blood away from the crappy alveoli, basically shove them over to where the alveoli are good. And that way I'm matching ventilation and perfusion. So I get maximum amount of gas exchange, taking all that, all that blood to those really good alveoli. So that's going to end this part of our respiratory physiology on gas exchange. The next thing we'll look at is how do we transport oxygen.